Everybody get their cups. Cheers. We're uh, in the belly of winter, February. Perhaps our topic is very appropriate, being in the belly of winter. Uh, Pithy Musings, just for our new watchers and viewers, is a vlog. <laughs> we learned and we keep on saying a video podcast, but apparently it is a vlog yeah. where we put the funk back being into human or into humanity. So We started this journey back January 2021 with the hopes of really talking about the whole human being. So there's lots of logs out there that talk about the professional, lots that talk about the personal, and our hopes uh, was to bring it together and talk about humanity as a whole and and hopefully in a pithy manner. Our guest, I won't uh, steal Eva's thunder, but she gave us a definition of pithy, which I actually liked, which is to be concise and meaningful. And I would say with a bit of a sarcastic spin. So that was a wonderful (laughs) ad. Um, Want to remind you that if you are enjoying these episodes, there is a subscribe button. If you subscribe to Pithy Musings, you will be informed when there is new content available. So with that, um, we appreciate you being here. We know we have some really loyal uh, viewers um, that comment and provide us feedback. So thank you once again for being here today. Eva, over to you. Thanks, Carolyn. And I uh, I have to thank some people who have given me some really quality feedback on the episodes, um, who have actually taken the time or written up summaries on what they loved and what they'd like to see next time. That is so awesome and such an act of generosity. So um, a big thank you. I think you know who you are, who are out there on their hikes, <laughs> listening to Pithy Musings, which totally rocks and sharing feedback. So thank you. Um, Before we introduce this amazing human being who is joining us, because this is the year where we invite guests, we wanted to get pithier, um, which can also mean, I think, unless I'm breaking code, um, we wanted to get more real, more raw, start putting um, tougher topics on the table that don't often get talked about that we think need to be talked about more um, and normalized as part of day-to-day conversation. Um, And today's conversation is going to be about trauma and demystifying what it means, what it is, and why that's important. And before we get into it, um, I really want to introduce someone I've known for how how many years, Kirsten Moline. Uh, We go way back to, where did we meet? Uh, We were probably 14, no, we were 15 years old meeting at a bus stop in our city, and we were both putting makeup on, late for class. (laughs) <laughs> separating eyelashes on she taught me about eyeliner and then I took eyeliner a little too seriously <laughs> um so Kirsten and I have been beloved friends I'd go as far as to say absolute family members for now decades um and I'm so proud of Kirsten's work over the years and humanity and all the things that you are in the world your work is mesmerizing Um, such an accomplished person in the trauma space, in the somatic space. Um, Kirsten is a, get ready, it's not going to be pithy, it's going to take an hour. Kirsten is a, I'm just joking, um, a registered BC social worker, a trauma-informed counsellor and facilitator, a somatic experience counsellor, and as well is a youth and family counsellor in the public school system with elementary school kiddos. Um, I can only imagine the fun and the joy and the good that you bring to their worlds. Um, so Kirsten, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you, girls. Hello, hello. Welcome. I never heard that story of introduction, by the way. <laughs> the bus stop. Oh, yeah. Oh. Bus stop. There's, I actually... We took our eyelashes seriously. We took them seriously. And, and uh, here's a little put you on the spot moment. Um, what's another memory from our youth that comes to mind? 
there's many. I don't know if I'd share them all here. <laughs> we always talk about trauma and boundaries. I have a feeling I wouldn't. Do you have, can you give me a hint? Well, one that comes to mind is when I had moved to London and I was pursuing some early onset career years and Kirsten had come to Edinburgh. Um, and so we would take the Red Arrow bus between the two cities and we would visit one another. Um, and many stories, way too many stories and probably want to honor choice and boundaries. Um, but we had a very good time. We'll just put yeah, it that way. We had a very good time. I spent a year saving money to go to Scotland. Eva had already gone to London. She was literally my lifeline to the UK. Um, I decided I'd spend two, three weeks with her and then go up and, you know, travel throughout Scotland. But in two or three weeks, I think we blew through all my money. That was it. <laughs> so I had to go to Scotland and find a job like the next day. And then once I got settled there, we would spend a lot of time going back and forth on that, on that bus, that overnight bus between London and, and Edinburgh. Yeah. Yeah. And living yeah. in tiny little places. I think the place I uh, you and your husband, Kevin, who you met in Edinburgh would come and stay with me. And I think my, my suite in London, I really wanted to live alone. Um, and to be able to do that and make it affordable, it was the size of a shoebox. I think it was maybe 300 square feet. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, lots so of generous in sharing it with us too. Getting to know you. Um, <laughs> so, so back to the trauma thing and um, Carolyn and I, one of our early onset episodes was everyone has a story. It was our most watched episode to date. And it had, had us wondering why is that? And I think people just seek understanding, um, yearn to be seen, heard and understood. And yet there, I think there's a trauma connection. There's so much we don't know about what's going on for someone in their story. And it got us curious. And then since seeing Gabor Mate's uh, premiere that came out last year on, I'm forgetting the name of it, but he's done such an incredible body of work on trauma that definitely demystified for some of us what trauma is, where it comes from. And all of a sudden, so many of us started to see ourselves in it. And then you realize that people who maybe don't have homes could have been any one of us. Are addicted, could have been any one of us. What separates maybe us? Go ahead. Maybe a really appropriate place to start and turn it over to Kirsten is, and thank you so much for being here. And I love the fact that you're, your history. I think that's beautiful. Maybe we could start, Kirsten, with a definition of trauma for our viewers and yeah. watchers. Yes, you can do that. And as, uh, as I was mentioning to you before we started recording, I'm a bit of a Luddite. So if I'm looking down, it's because I'm looking at my, my hand, hard copy, hand handheld things that I need. Um, so I think there is a lot of misconceptions about what trauma is. And I think there's a lot of people who experience situations and they think that isn't trauma, I should be fine. And then they're not fine. And then they feel shame and guilt and kind of isolation around uh, how they show up after this. So from a trauma informed perspective, trauma is uh, defined any one event or events, it can be one event or it could be multiple, that causes our central nervous system to become overwhelmed or has us feeling unsafe. And there's three different types um, of trauma. There's like acute, so it's like one car accident could be. There is uh, chronic, which could be an example of living in um, chaos in your childhood and having repeated lack of safety, whether it may be neglect, it might be being around domestic violence, it might be um, around parents with substance abuse. That's a chronic interrelational um, trauma. And then there's also complex, which is kind of both. So when you have maybe a childhood and those really, really important developmental years, particularly birth to five um, years old, if you didn't get what you needed and have healthy attachments, when you may have a car accident, when you're 15 or 16, it might take you a lot longer to recover or you may not recover. And then so you're suddenly 50 going, why can't I get out of bed? And why, why can't I hold work? And why are my relationships suffering? And so, so it's any one event. Some examples of, the, of uh, trauma can include growing up around domestic violence, like I mentioned, a car accident or accidents, as I mentioned, uh, mental, emotional abuse, unexpe unexpected passing away of a loved one. And that's the shock. Yep. 
portion, the unexpected. Mm -hmm. uh, severe bullying, and that can be as a child in school, in the school system, or it can be actually in the workplace as well as an adult. Harassment, mm -hmm. discrimination, serious injuries, major surgery or life-threatening illnesses. Um, physical, sexual abuse, prolonged periods spent in an unsafe environment or circumstances, and neglect. And those are just some of. So that's so perhaps kind of another another term or terms around what you've just said is like a one-time event being acute, I guess, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ongoing or relentless, and then what you said is complex. And so, mm -hmm. my guess is that trauma is well. I you know as we were preparing for this episode because we had decided on this episode several weeks ago. You know, one goes inward and starts thinking, well, do I got trauma? Have I, which ones? All three? Okay. Um, yeah. So if, if, if one would have all three is the, is how you a approach that in terms of getting healthy and well, uh, the same, or is it all very individualistic? I would say I would say it's individual. I would I would say that no two people's experience are the same. If we're talking about say childhood, so um, if it's acute, just say you've never you've had a really really like very very psychologically safe, emotionally physically safe childhood, and you have a car accident when you're 17 or 18, um, and then you get everything you need after that. And what I mean by everything we need when we have a trauma is someone, and I, I put this in notes too, that you can share with your, your viewers, listeners, um, right. subscribers, that, um, sorry, the S word. So <laughs> what we need, what we need when we have actually experienced trauma is empathetic witness. That is actually one of the key things. So whether it's acute or chronic or complex, like I laid out, if we, uh, so just say this is the same example I'm talking about, this person who's had a great, really healthy childhood, everyone hears these and values them, they're allowed to speak their way, they have their food, they have their shelter, they're um, allowed to self-actualize, they're allowed to have autonomy, they're allowed to disagree with their parents and not be shamed and abused and neglected and punished, all those things. If they have a car accident at 17, and then you have someone around them that says it wasn't a big deal, just walk it off, that will be impactful for them, yeah. right? And that's the, uh, that was, that's an example of opposite of empathetic witness. So, but if you have, you know, paramedics and people on the street that say, oh my gosh, this car accident happened, we're stopping everything, we're calling the, the appropriate people to tend to you, that's empathetic witness. Someone who's had really severe, chronic, complex trauma, that car accident may, not always, may be harder to navigate. It may be harder. And it might be because, uh, because we can't choose who, what family we're born into. We may not have a lot of safe people in our life, period, and we've had to create our own community uh, once we left home or were able to be away from home. There's lots of different examples in that. But there really is no formula. What the piece is, is if you notice, like how we notice trauma shows up, I think is the is the most important thing. And if we notice, oh, this is happening for me, then maybe I could guess, I could reach out for some support, right? It's, it's not, and we can kind of go, we can kind of make ourselves uh, a little nutty by thinking, well, so-and-so had four traumas and I had three, but I had different parents than he or she did and why, why, why? We can really get stuck in the why, which takes away the energy and the momentum of healing. So, and also just accepting, hey, this is what happened. And I think there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, the, the society that I grew up in anyways here in Western Canada is that there's a lot of uh, pull your bootstraps up, just minimize it, don't, especially for um, heterosexual men in the community. There's, yeah. you know, some major um, epidemics of suicide ideation in men in their 40s and 50s because they've had years and years of just bottling everything up. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, to be seen as weak if you show emotion. And women also can, ex you know, experience that too. But I would say the acknowledgement of even if five people in your life say, oh, that isn't a trauma, you shouldn't be dealing with that, you should be over it by now. That's a, a, a pretty good example of someone who isn't really offering any empathetic witness. And you don't have to, if, if you can. Hopefully you have choice not to spend tons of time with them because that's not helpful for healing. Something yeah. saying just get over it. It's not a big deal. Um, and then to just be like, it doesn't have to mean anything to anyone but me. If I'm struggling, if I'm yeah. showing up in these ways, I'm allowed yeah. to get help. So that, and I do have a list of ways in which trauma can show up. 
Well, let's go there, I think. Um, but I'm also thinking as you're speaking, uh, Kristen, is that I keep on coming to this phrase, it's all relative, right? Like, so you'll see someone who has all three of those, a one-time event, some complex ongoing stress, but they seemingly have it all together, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that man that you just illustrated. Um, and I want to hear the signs, but I think you know, again, I was preparing for the session going and talking to a few people and even reached out to a clinical psychologist and a shaman. <laughs> I totally yes, did. did. Thank you, Eva. Yes, I did. And thought, well, because I always thought that trauma was associated with the head. Like, and I do a lot of reading and I came, I learned, I knew the term somatic, but I never really dug into it before this body work. So from my understanding, and I would love to hear your perspective as an expert in this arena, is where do, does trauma fit in the head and the body? So, yes. So maybe you could walk us through uh, what somatic is, and then we can kind of yes. go through the symptoms. And then I'll shut totally. up, Eva. No, <laughs> Super oh, interesting. Never. No, let's, <laughs> no one ever wants to up. Let's do this. So, yes. Yeah, and so cool that you reached out to a shaman and a clinical counselor. That's like east, east and west merging. Awesome. So it really is. So if the if the definition of trauma that we're working with is any or one any one or events, single or multiple events that overwhelms our central nervous system, it's central nervous system impact, which is our brain, our eyeballs, and all of our nerves and our whole. If you ever Google the central nervous system outside of the skeleton is terrifying it could be put in any type of horror movie um because it's all about our senses it's really really quite intense so if a trauma impacts our uh, our central nervous system's ability to regulate right so that's the impact of a trauma is that you become dysregulated mm. right and we can't and and what somatic experience really is bottom-up processing instead of like head processing, you can't always talk yourself out of a trauma response. In fact, you can't. I mean, we can talk to ourselves after we're out of a trauma response and trauma response, like a trigger, a fight, flight, freeze response, which I'll go into a little bit more what that can look like. But we, um, I don't know if anyone's ever been dysregulated, activated, triggered, and just sitting down and saying, gosh, darn, quit it. No, it doesn't actually help. You have to have a lot of, you know, sometimes you need a bit of time, you need a bit of space, you need to have some like psychoeducation about what's happening so you don't have shame about your response. Think well, about, isn't that the, the challenge though, Kristen, is that I think our society tells us like, buck up, mm -hmm. buck up. I yeah. mean, we're all living life. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then that self-shame about why can't I get out of bed or why can't totally. I do this task that I know has to get done or why am I feeling this way yeah, um absolutely. you know can, and then and then that worsens I would imagine the trauma it absolutely worsens the math because what what we know about trauma and shame is they're like they're like hand in glove and the more shame we have about something the the um the heavier the impact of trauma can be guaranteed and an a, a absolute marker of trauma is isolation in isolation we can feel more shameful because we actually aren't sharing what's going on with us we don't know that you know I don't I used to facilitate groups um trauma-informed groups and I cannot tell you every single time we would have a group of you know 20 women 15 women and they people would start sharing appropriately you know not in super big details about their about how their trauma is has impacted them and their eyes are just like dinner plates. So like, oh my gosh, I've, I've been at home for five years thinking I'm the only person that is feeling this impact. And then they're like, oh, I'm gonna come to group every day because I'm not alone. And that's what a really big impact of trauma is feeling alone, feeling isolated, feeling shameful. Like if only I was stronger, I wouldn't be feeling this. Um, but a fight, flight, freeze response, I feel like we need to go into it now. Yeah, is go for it. Is a central nervous system response when we're feeling threat. And we don't actually have to feel an actual threat to have a fight, flight, freeze response. Um, it's physiologically impossible to control our fight, flight, freeze. Just like if you were a deer in the Serengeti and there was a lion behind you, you heard a snap of a twig and you turned around, that deer doesn't go, hmm, I'm gonna notice the sky. I'm gonna saunter over here. I'm gonna go make myself a cup of tea. That would be really funny if that deer <laughs> right? a cup of tea. <laughs> what that deer is going to do instead is go, I'm going to either, depending on how far that line is from me, that threat, I'm either going to run 
I'm either going to go into the water and freeze, and maybe he or she didn't see me, or I'm going to um, turn and fight. Mm -hmm. So the thing about shame with our trauma responses, as soon as we talk about not like, oh my God, why am I doing so bad today? Why can't I get out of bed? Why am I so anxious? Why can't I ask for what I need? And why am I running away from jobs or relationships or blowing them up or whatever that is? If we actually go from the central nervous system um, entry point and say, what's my system doing? Okay, my system is either fight, flight, freeze. Sometimes we can notice what's happening with practice. Sometimes we don't know at all. We just know we're kind of, I call it offline. It's the flipping the lid thing. So our frontal lobe goes pop off that deer when it sees the lion that brain that frontal lobe will go offline and it will literally go to to getting themselves safe which is exactly what happens to us humans so the more we work with how does our central nervous system show up the less shame we can possibly have right and if we say I mean, the opposite of, um, of shame is compassion. So we can be compassionate to ourselves. It's like the antidote. Hey, today, I don't understand why I went to a freeze response, but I did. I wonder what my system needs. Okay, it needs a warm bath. It might need to talk with someone who's a safe human. It might need to sing. Like, there's all these different strategies we can do to bring our central nervous system back online. Um, and I think every time I tell clients, we can't control the fight, flight, freeze, but we can work and practice with how we take care of ourselves when we are triggered, when we are feeling that threat response. Um, you would never ask a deer to sit down and like conduct a, a you know, facilitate a group when a lion lurking. And that's the tricky thing is often a lot of clients will say, there's no lion. I'm on the bus and you know, someone walks past me uh, and I'm, they may have the same cologne of someone who hurt me. And then suddenly I'm there, I'm triggered, which makes sense. That's a very one plus one equals two. And sometimes the, the, the central nervous system can be an overload time of year, right? It can, Christmas is extremely challenging time for us trauma survivors. They're really, really um, like the sight, sounds, smells, you know, even just the flowers that are might be blooming or not blooming. There's different times of year that can have an anniversary of, of a trauma or a time or a loss, whatever that might be. So the biggest place that I try and um, support everyone that I work with is that we can't, since we can't control the fight, flight, freeze, we can practice how we speak to ourselves with love and compassion and empathy like you would a best friend so mm -hmm. if your best friend or your dearest sister or your anyone who you absolutely adore if they said oh I just I had a panic attack on the bus today and I couldn't make it I couldn't make it to my class or my work or that appointment or that date you mm -hmm. probably wouldn't say well you suck you wouldn't talk to your friend that way so right. Part of the antidote to that shame within the trauma response, if we're still trying to figure out what it is, maybe people haven't gone to therapy yet or haven't done this kind of a newer kind of topic, talking gently to ourselves like we would talk to our best friends, our dearest people is helpful because the more shame we give ourselves, the more uh, fight, flight, freeze response we can have. Uh, and also in saying that, if we've had a lifetime of no one speaking gently to us, talking gently to ourselves can be extremely foreign and really hard. So being also very kind in the process of learning how to accept the kindness. It's, it's quite a, it can be quite a journey that way. Uh, and we don't have to believe everything we say to ourselves, right? I, uh, I, I know that when uh, I did groups and they're six months long, the very beginning of the group, we would do um, affirmation cards. And there was one card that said, um, I'm amazing and I'm beautiful. And at the very beginning of the group, first month in, people are like, nope, don't like that card, not in you because you had a choice to pass. Mm -hmm. Trauma informed, you get choice. Uh, and then by the end of the group, six months later, people are like, this is my card. And I'm saying it loud, like not everyone, but it was an interesting slow progression of um, getting used to holding space and saying kind things to ourselves and nice things to ourselves, right? So uh, that it doesn't mean that in six months, everyone's trauma is going to be shifted in a way in that timeline. Um, I've had every, I think every person I've worked with said, so when is this going to end? This sucks. I hate this. I, not the therapy, but just the responses. Yeah. Uh, and the, um, the, the easiest thing to say and the hardest thing to hear is that um, the quickest way to heal is go slow. So that's not always fun when people are like, but I'm having panic attacks on the bus and can't get to work. What do I do? So it's, so maybe I'll go back to how it can show up because then it's going to be into strategies of how we can take care of ourselves unless there's any, any questions. 
comments? Well, I, I am curious about something. Well, there's a few things whirling in my brain and I, and I, and I, and I absolutely want to get to strategies. I, there are questions like, Things like over the past couple of years, the pandemic seems to, I'm noticing with some of my client work, people use the language of, I found it really triggering. And I sometimes wonder if they know what that means. And I also want to honor the line between therapy and coaching. Um, but I'm noticing people speaking of themselves or others where they're triggered or they're in shame or their self-doubt has really gone down um, or they get the fight, flight, freeze response. And it seems to ha have ele like accelerated and it's happening more often. And so what is your observation of what's happening in this time? And what is the connection to trauma? Because we have no idea when this is over. We think we're almost there, <laughs> but we don't know. So what are you noticing? Well, I have, I've noticed a lot. I know that this pandemic is a trauma. Yeah. Uh, it's and so if we're back, going back to the, the definition of trauma, it's and it overwhelms our central nervous system, um, and it's also in combination with something out of our control, right? Mm. So this pandemic could be connecting to like little Christmas lights that all work, <laughs> right? Little Christmas lights of all of our traumas before. It can also have us low resource because we're exhausted. We have pandemic fatigue. We have a virus that is actually asymptomatic, which is very different than other viruses that may show up with symptoms only. And then if you have a symptom, then you know, and I'm like, okay, I can contain that. I understand that. I can place that. I have symptoms. I stay home. Because of an asymptomatic virus that's invisible, there's a lot of um, threat response in that way. There can be a lot of our, our fight, flight, freeze is amped up. Our resources are lower. And one of the best ways to heal and to navigate our fight, flight, freeze is a uh, social connection with other people in person. <laughs> Not to minimize any Zoom, because I've been counseling, I've been doing trauma counseling since the pandemic started on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, I work in person with the kids and families I work with now, but in masks and not able to see each other's faces and outside meetings as much as possible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what we need social connection, social engagement, actually to be with another central nervous system, a healthy, mm -hmm. safe one, not someone who's dysregulated and abusive. That is actually what we need. Uh, like we're social beings, we're social animals. We need to be with other people to feel connected, to have some of that fight, flight, freeze settle. And so if you think of just the isolation factor, and it's now 20, next month, it'll be two years. So March 13th is the kind of the date that I have in my head where everything was like, do you think we should, you know, put up some extra sanitation signs in the office? And I think we might be home for a week. And then boom, yeah. everything's right. gone. And we are still, some people are still not back in offices, right? So, and I think the ever-changing moving goalposts can be really dysregulating too. So just when you get like, okay, I'm okay. And then you have also, when the vaccinations came, there was a sigh of relief. And then there was also, a, for some, for others, they got even more nervous and they didn't want to have the vaccine. And there's a whole kind of adversarial piece that shit that was part of like the last year, easily last eight, nine months. In my experience anyways, in the city I live in is that um, we can go to restaurants, but we can't go to restaurants with our friends who don't have vaccinations. We can go to hockey games and see our kids play, but if a grandparent decides no vaccine, they can't come and navigating all those dynamics. Yeah. So, I would say it makes it more complex and just the actual, um, it's just like uh, the endurance, the sheer endurance that everyone's yeah. literally had to navigate multiple stressors all the time. If sometimes there's people who, um, I mean, domestic violence is, you know, incidents have gone up, uh, reporting's less because there's less uh, investigations perhaps with children, but I mean, violence has gone through the roof because if you're isolating at home with someone who's unsafe, that actually is so even more dangerous than, than before the pandemic. So there's so many things happening, um, but I would say uh, generally, I would say everyone is completely tapped out and don't know where the reserves go to um, and pivoting is such a beautiful thing that we can all pivot, we can shift, we can move, we can group, but we nothing really replaces that engagement with people in person without masks, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is, and it's and it's not like we're like, oh, it's um, and it's literally something that we've never dealt with. 
none of our, I mean, any generations I've ever dealt with, I'm just trying to think of all the people in my family and the elderly, no one has ever dealt with anything on this level before that's been so global and it's been so restricted. And I think what's important to say too, as an insertion around the pandemic, for those that are listening and watching is you're not alone. Like I, I, you know, as you're talking through that, I'm right in there. Like, yeah, 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 and yeah. And I think when you talk about not isolating or that we need human connection, Mm -hmm. it's a great reminder to reach out to old friends or ask for support or participate in social activities and even, you know, kind of stretch your comfort zone if you don't really want to do that. Yeah. And, or be like, why do I not, why is my brain not working? Like, and we're all different and introvert, extrovert too. Like I'm a true extrovert. I know, even though I do really a lot of output in terms of work, it lights me up. It's important. It helps gets my juices going. My batteries get like lit up, but it's like, why am I feeling like a little grumpy one? Oh, I haven't gone for a walk with Eva. Eva is one of my outlets. We walk and do a hike around this lake. We walk for dogs, all those things. Like once I have that, I'm lit up in a different way, even yeah. though we're not like, you know, we're not like linking arms hiking. We have, yeah. you know, we're both, you know, we're safe and all those things in terms of social distancing, but there's something about, Oh yeah, that's what I needed. That's what I haven't been doing. And my, my amount of engaging with people regularly has just gone so much more contained, right? It's, it's less than, Oh, that's what I need. And just being like, Oh yeah, I'm going to honor that. If I'm extra grumpy, I'm going to be gentle on myself. I may, may maybe take, you know, better care of myself instead of being like, why can't I do this pandemic better? Like, as I like, like this, it's been a hard pandemic. I have a colleague that says every time I talk to her, I was like, "How are you?" She's like, "It's been a hard pandemic." I was like, "Yep, it sure has in many different ways, right?" Well, I think the pandemic also emphasizes the point around uh, a myth that we can walk around with, or or just the not knowing where we can go. Well, what's wrong with me? What the heck is wrong with me? Why do I? Why am I reacting this way, or feeling this way, or thinking this way? Um, you know, whether it's the pandemic or uh, being at work in certain dynamics or being in certain community organizations or at home, why am I, why am I responding this way? What's wrong with me when, and that gets into everybody has a, has a story. Um, I'm curious about myths too. I was reading this article. um, uh, Well, it was a post from uh, a handle healing from PTSD. It was on Instagram and on a forum called Open Talk. And I'll, I'll just read these out. And I'm curious if, if you know, either of you connect with these. And, and the question I have for you in this is it like, is it okay to ask these? I don't think it's okay to ask these questions at all. So my question at the end of this will be, what is okay to ask someone if they're not okay? to honor choice Mm. and boundaries. And so um, some of the assumptions that we observe include some may think you should be over it later on in life. Some may ask what happened? Like what happened to you? Not even realizing that this may be super triggering. Some may ask, why didn't you fight back? Mm. Some may ask, why do you let it have so much power over you? Yeah. Some may ask, Um, or one other one is you're in therapy. Why aren't you getting any better? Uh, or if it was so bad, why didn't you leave or report it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I read through these, I'm like, but I've also had the gift of having access to therapy over the years. Um, having one of my longtime besties be you Kirsten. So we have so many juicy conversations. So I think I'm so informed, but I'm not uh, this is devastating to think how common these questions are. So I'm curious about your response to that. And what is okay to be asking people if we're genuinely interested in their well-being? I would say, maybe I'll answer the last question first. What's okay? I would go along with checking, like a, a true check-in is, how are you? Do you want to talk about it? You don't have to talk about it. I'm just noticing that you're struggling and I'm here for you if you want. Like that's a true kind of holding space for. Um, And and often we are concerned. We may want to, you know, like problem solve. We may be like, I don't get it. Often, I mean, my experience with my clients that have experienced, you know, um, all the isms, right? So racism, sexism, homophobia, um, 
patriarchy, domestic violence, cycle of abuse, like there's, a, there's no, usually uh, there's two questions in there either that like, why didn't you leave? Why didn't you fight back is very specific domestic violence cycle of abuse context. So that tells me the person asking that question doesn't understand it. So if I was a person dealing with domestic violence and someone asked me that, I would set boundaries with that person. Mm -hmm. I would not use any of my time, energy or resources having to explain anything. I would go and get specific domestic violence support mm -hmm. or sexualized violence support mm -hmm. um, because there, it, we're, it's not our job as survivors to explain to people who are uninformed. So yeah. some of those and most of those questions are very shame-based. They're very um, punitive, they're very adversarial, they're very, um, they're not very, they're definitely not trauma informed, like absolutely not. Um, yeah, and, and so I would, in terms of if you are a survivor and you're having these people ask you questions or people like, for whatever reason, sometimes the people asking those questions are in, in charge of your income assistance check. Right. So I so people who, again, have power over us that will make or break me able to have an apartment and feed my kids. They're like, why isn't your counseling done yet? Why, aren't, why can't you just get back to work? Mm -hmm. I think in my in my uh, I did career counseling years and years ago, life skills programs and career counseling. And I know that that was one of the most harmful things. Every single one of my client talked about saying they went to the ministry. I, you know, for for check issue day. And some of the conversation or some of the check that, you know, like I have to show I'm looking for work and yet I have all of these things that I'm dealing with and kind of trying to heal from. And there was just uh, not a lot of understanding of the impacts of trauma that you don't just, you don't go through, you know, an entire childhood of chaos and trauma and just go out and get a job and, you know, tighten up that resume and everything's great. We know that trauma, because it dysregulates our system, it affects our mental health. It um, has us using substances to regulate our system. And that's really, and that's what Gabor Mate and, and a lot of his work talks about. And he's a, he's a doctor, downtown Eastside, uh, downtown Eastside Vancouver doctor, who's now doing speaking tours. If he comes to a city near you, if you're interested in this work, trauma-informed care, go see him, he's lovely. He's a survivor himself. Um, he talks a lot about how most of his clients downtown he said Vancouver, which has an incredible um, epidemic of addiction um, and pain. He said every single person he treated and served was had an extensive chronic complex trauma history. They didn't get what they needed, particularly in certain crucial childhood stages in terms of development and attachment. Um, and when we're that dysregulated, we're going to do, you know, we're going to do drugs, alcohol, um, relationships, sex, gambling, online shopping, uh, you name it. If it's a substance that can have us regulate our system from dysregulation to regulation, we're going to do it. So, but I just want to go yeah. back to, to what Eva, your question, um, because as you went through some of those myths, I'll, I'll be candid. I'm, I might've said some iteration of that, but with the, the loveliest of intent, Totally. Right. Like what happened or, yeah. I, you know, I, yeah. I thought you were at house therapy going like, so for that, our that's viewers. That's a different and, tone though. That's a different tone. Okay. Right? How are you? Yeah. How is therapy going? That sounds like curious, inquisitive. Okay. Caring. But like, how okay. are you? Like, why is it like, you've been in okay. therapy. So maybe okay. I, maybe I assumed the tone of, of what Eva was saying because of the other kind of mess looped in. So I, yeah. So my yeah, so I want no, no, no. There's, I yeah. just want to make sure that we're equipping our your your tone is are, lovely. Okay, <laughs> right? Your tone is like, how are you? And also to know that it's not our none of our business how people are doing. If every time you're like say meeting someone and they don't show up, like that's yeah. an example of being like, how are things going? Like I know you talked about going to therapy. I don't need to know what's going on. It's not my business. But I'm noticing like you used to really show up and now you're not. Are you okay? Yeah. Do you need anything? Like if you're coming from a curious, um, how are you? And a lot of people don't understand impacts of trauma. And so they're trying to figure it out themselves. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. No, you're, you're allowed to be curious and be like, I don't get it. And the job would be us to do our own research around that. Right. Um, so I think I mean, that that's a natural segue into, cause we didn't really, get, I, I don't think yet really cover all of the signs of trauma. So you talked about the opposite of trauma being, you know, isolation and, um, but I would imagine there's a delineation between, again, between the emotional and the physical. 
So maybe we can walk through some of the signs of trauma. So, you know, shock, denial, concentration, these are some things that we talked about. Are there others that we could explore? There's so many. <laughs> and there's okay. just as many, if not more, indications that you're healing and things you can do to help too. So don't, it's not all doom and gloom. Sorry. Eve, yeah, no, we'll definitely go to the other side. Because I think one of the one of the signs we've talked about, and I know you're about to share to share more and many, which I think are so important because part of this whole episode is helping to identify. Um, and so, but I think of I think of myself, workaholism. I have a whole history. Kirsten, you've watched me do it. Carolyn, we've known each other for a little less time, but you've probably seen symptoms where I have to wrestle with it and I still yeah. have to wrestle with it. Um, or, you know, or I've no, I, I have to keep it in check also as a duty to, to the work that I do now and for my own well being and health. And I've now seen that there's a connection. But workaholism has been my, I don't even know that I've ever called it that, but that's what it's been. It's yeah, been it's my coping anger. strategy. Totally. And when the shit hit the fan, I could go to work. Oh, yep. oh boy. I, I, oh, look at that task list. Oh, yeah. yes. And yeah. you're rewarded in your community for doing that. So you're also oh. like, it's a double, it's a double whammy for you, even your yeah. example and other people who may feel, oh, my coping strategy, I'm just going to do more. I'm going to be really excellent. I'm going to sit into my career. I'm going to, you know, and often it's at the cost to our health or our relationships or whatever that might be, or not, depending on what your family makeup is, mm -hmm. who you live with, who you share your life with. But it's um it's a we live in a society generally that rewards workaholism. And right, yeah. like it's like, oh yeah, especially for women. Oh, we can do it all, you're juggling everything. How can you do this? Like, and so that's also very affirming. So if you're in this like groove of and this like well-worn path of workaholism as a coping strategy, you're gonna be rewarded and held up and, and have that accolade. So that, and that feels good. We want people to be like, yeah, that's great. And you wanna be like, yeah, I feel good about myself. So it's actually, I mean, it's a very, 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 very common one. Well, and I also bring it up because my intuition says that listeners and viewers that are in some of our networks can connect with that. And to be able to know when it's, when it's, when it's reasonable and healthy and when it's completely hijacked yeah. one's well-being, but, um, would love to hear other, other okay. signs to Carolyn's question. Yeah. So, really interested. So these are just some ways it's not, not an exhaustive list, but it's a list. Um, and the reason why I have so many details and so many different examples is that often people are like, Oh, I had a car accident and now I don't like driving anymore. That's my trauma. That's how it shows up. That's one plus mm -hmm. one equals two. But sometimes it's like one plus one equals a banana and people are like, what's wrong with me? That's when the shame happens and we feel worse about ourselves. We isolate, we pull away all those things. So this is what, how it can show up. Um, impacts our ability to have healthy relationships with others and with ourselves. And an example I talk about is negative self-talk. So sometimes we take over the voice. There might be a voice in our childhood or uh, in a unsafe situation that talks down to us. They, we may leave that situation, but we also may start taking over that voice. And I'm so bad. Like, oh, I had a panic attack on the bus. You're so bad, Kirsten, right? Um, substance misuse can happen as a way to regulate a dysregulated system. And any substance, any substance, and sometimes the substance can be working, like you talked about, right? Mm -hmm. Workaholism. Mm -hmm. uh, mental health challenges, poor concentration, like foggy brain. That's a lot of a lot of indications. Uh, sometimes these are going to be behavioral. Sometimes these are going to be physio physiology. Sometimes they're going to be um, kind of mental health. Uh, the behavior of putting others' needs way before our own. <laughs> always and exclusively and that's a tricky one for a lot of moms that I've worked with especially a lot of single moms I've worked with uh and especially moms who have um kids with complex needs it's like if I don't do it the child doesn't eat I can't just be like no I'm gonna go on a spa day and you know, that's not what we're necessarily talking about it's the uh so if we're not talking about like parent and child or adult and child we're just talking like two adults it's always like no 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 you you decide you decide and they know the reason how we know it's unhealthy is if it has a cost to us yeah. so if we always say yes when we actually mean no that's going to be a cost to us that's going to have an emotional build up that's going to build resentment that's when we leave relationships or friendships or just not show up at work because we haven't been able to kind of articulate what we need and ask for what we need so putting other people's needs in front of ours often is the way that we coped and survived a lot of things and then we realize maybe in adulthood that doesn't serve us because, oh my gosh, none of my needs are getting met. 
And then that's part of the healing journey. There's one thing. How to put put our needs in in front of other people's too. Go ahead. I'm I'm really curious. There's something about this that had Carolyn and I start laughing. Oh, what was it? Curious what was it putting other needs others needs before your own? Oh yeah, we both know we do that. Yeah. We, we, we've had these chats before. I'll, I won't speak for you. Sorry. I'll speak for myself. <laughs> we'll take you down my rabbit hole. Yeah. And I think it's the nature of what we do, right? It's the, the nature of what we do is to serve, to help, to um, elevate others. That's really the definition of at least what I do in, in, in my practice. But where I'm struggling as we're talking, I'll just be super candid, is how do I connect that to my trauma? Like, yes, this shows up as characteristics of Carolyn for sure. Um, but how do we, or is that the more complex process of working with someone in a psychologically safe, nurtured environment that can help you with both that mind and somatic work to, to bring that to the fore with you? And I'm deeply interested. And in, like I said, I've reached out to these other um, clinicians, just because I, I actually think, well, first of all, how could it hurt? Mm-hmm. And we're all trying to get better, right? In the, in this human experience. Yeah. So again, how, power, is right? that, is that how you start blow, blowing through those connections around trauma? If someone is noticing, I, th- I think it's, it's, if we get caught in the why we can spin our wheels. Yep. The indication is, is my, is my, are my symptoms, symptoms, right? Symptoms or my behaviors or my uh, ill health and I'll continue on the list too. If if those are getting worse, then maybe I need to do something different. And if our pattern has always been, sometimes there's a lot of, um, a lot of um, childhood abuse survivors that literally could not take care of their own needs. They had to literally let take care of everyone else's because that's how they kept safe. When we're right. in adulthood, if we still stay in that pattern, that will that will wear and tear in our system. So sometimes it's about shifting patterns, becoming aware. Hey, I'm not a bad person because I take care of the people before me. That was maybe something that was just ingrained, right? Maybe also in our patriarchal society that women being appeasing and easy, easy and accommodating and caring is definitely rewarded, right? So there's this, there's many different layers depending on our history, but the I think the thing is, if, if I'm showing up with certain, you know, behavior symptoms or illnesses that are really not working for anymore, how can I take care of to come to the other side of, of more ease, more healing? And sometimes it's changing patterns. Sometimes it's setting boundaries with people we've never set boundaries with before. Sometimes it's setting boundaries with ourselves, how much output, what we do, all those things. But I would say if there's complex chronic history of trauma therapy definitely will be something that would be supported if and when that person is ready and interested and I just had an epiphanal moment mm-hmm. so when you address trauma as an adult hopefully you're not looking at it as that inner child that experienced that tra- like if it was a childhood trauma right you you show up with the individual that has you know decades more of experience and can possibly look at it a little bit more objectively or open to going through that energetic healing process it could but sometimes it's the opposite of what i think you might be saying we know we're having a trauma response as an adult when we're younger than the age we are Mm. and that is who we need to tend to in therapy Mm -hmm. and (laughs) trauma-informed therapy somatic therapy younger self it's called reparenting there's lots of different modalities, but in, I do tons of reparenting with my clients mm-hmm. that we can't jump back in a, a time machine. We can't make something different. We can't control what anyone does, but we can tend to that younger part of ourselves or that younger self that never mm-hmm. got tended to, didn't get what he or she needed. He, she, or he needed, excuse me. So there's a lot of, um, uh, that happened so long ago. Why is it still with you? It's because there was no empathetic witness. It might have been mm-hmm. there was too much chaos happening, and people around you didn't know how to take <laughs> care of you. Could have been that you were born into a family where you pull up your bootstraps, and any type of you know sadness was seen as weakness. So you knew to keep a lid on that. So part of being an adult grieving childhood trauma really is tending to holding space for and noticing that younger part, and then because often most of my clients are like, I feel like I'm five right now. And all they can do is cry. Or yeah. I was on the bus, I had a panic attack. I felt like I was 10, but I'm 42, right? Yeah. Like, and then there's shame, like, oh my gosh, why do I feel so young? That's because your trauma's talking. There was something that happened in that age range and 
five is a very, very important developmental stage. If you didn't get your needs met, you didn't get what you needed attachment wise, that will, that will carry with you. That will stay with you. I have a lot of clients wow. that, that will be like, oh, my coping strategies work until they didn't. And often, yeah. and often it's workaholism or it's addiction or it's other things, but they're just like, actually, I, I went to the hospital with like heart palpitations. And the doctor's yeah. like, well, how many hours are you working? Or are you getting an exercise? Are you seeing people like this kind of well-rounded, holistic? How are you taking care of yourself? And you're like, no, I'm not doing any of that. Yeah. <laughs> and then the doctor's like, okay, right? So, and then often, and especially in my career counseling background, before I became a trauma counselor, people would do their coping strategies that they knew would serve them at one point. Yeah. That wasn't serving them anymore. That had a cost to their system and they had to yeah. leave work. They had to leave yeah. work for stress really, um, stress reasons, medical reasons um their system just couldn't take any more and so often the healing process is shifting patterns honoring self honoring that younger part of ourselves or that younger self our younger selves that never got what they needed um and tending to it in the way and somatic experiencing does a lot of uh which i've talked to a little bit later because it's probably too much to add at the moment but just really noticing um there's different ways that somatic experiencing can happen and part of it is like imagery and meaning making and sometimes that can be oh I'm seeing myself as five you know and what and also what did that five-year-old do that five-year-old survived that that five-year-old is here now at 42 talking about it and so we talk about that resi- trauma-informed care is also like resilience-based strength-based like look at what you did often there's a really really miss I, I think it's a very incorrect really really incorrect idea in our kind of general society that survivors aren't resilient and in fact if you hear some of the things that people have had to um, endure the resilience is astronomical yeah like absolutely astronomical um and we're not i'm not just talking about you know clients that like fled war-torn countries and came to canada and were refugees and i'm having to support i'm talking about people in canada growing up in like absolute chaos uh repeatedly chronically uh, it's like a war for them, right? So, yeah. so yeah. So I, I do, I do think that um, that's what I. I mean, often the whole kind of child adult thing. If we don't tend to the 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 child part of us that got hurt, our adult self will just continue on doing the thing until they doing until it doesn't work anymore. And that's usually what everyone says. Like, oh my gosh, I just thought I'd do an extra day of work and I was fine, and now I I can't breathe. I'm having panic attacks. Right? Like it comes. There's a physiology that comes with that. So, well, you've said it a few times now, which no, you beautiful. This is like we're even I are on the edge of our seat. I don't know if you're noticing, but I love pain after this. I know. Well, so you said it's worked until it's not going to work anymore. So I'm just wondering when the edge is going to fall out for me, (laughs) candidly for my viewers and watchers. But just to add to that, I had a um, a massage therapist once say to me, so we were talking about some of the signs, right? Mm-hmm. Shaming and all that. She said to me something that I will never forget. And she said, your issues are your tissues. Yeah, we say that in somatic experience. Oh, is that what they say? Your okay. issues are in, in your tissues. And that's like the body, where that's what somatic experience really is. It's where soma is the Greek word for body. And so that's where the trauma has stayed and gotten trapped. And the only way I can explain that without doing five hours of somatic experience to explain, because it's really an experiential thing, like receiving it, doing yeah. it is really kind of how you get it. But just say I had a car accident and I wasn't able, like my threat, my, my protective um, physical movement from holding, I couldn't hold a car that's coming at me, right? So I get hit. So what happens is all that life energy, that protective life energy, like a deer with the lion, right? That, that's going to be that palpable. It has been incomplete. A lot of somatic work is completing an incomplete. And that's that tissue thing. It's in our system. So that's when, when I, I've had to do many, 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 many hours of somatic uh, experiencing as a client as part of my training. And it's amazing how you're like, oh, I'm four again. I'm seven again. I'm there. I can see it, you know, like, or I'm 16 when I first started driving. And there's some movements and gentle getting used to um, certain sensations, body sensations and emotions to help complete it. So it doesn't get stuck. It's, um, and for a long time, I couldn't totally rotate my neck fully to the right. Because a lot of my car accidents, and this is my example I'll use, a lot of my currencies came up from the side for some reason, just happened to be. Um, and my rotation and my neck was like, even when I, even just in the world, like my, my shoulder checks were not as fulsome as my, as my other side. And I did some somatic work and my rotation is 
it's just a, it's quite amazing. So there is a, there is a issues in your tissues, even though I don't think it's like issues. I don't know if I like that word necessarily, but I like how it rhymes. It no, but like personally, I can identify with that. I remember being about 30 and then woke up one day and it wasn't from a sleeping thing. I could not move the right side of my body. So as you're talking, I'm now starting to make yeah. some connections that I've yet to make. Um, digestive issues, right? Like stuff like that throughout, throughout the years, mm -hmm. which is likely connected to trauma, stress, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. really fascinating work. Eva, did you want to go to, and then what? Like, what are some things that we should be for experiencing some of these signs? I have a couple yeah, more gonna... signs I might include though, and then go to what can we do? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go for That's it. That's all right. Well, of course. Yeah. Eva, did you want to say something before? I oh, that? no. I mean, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. You okay. carry on. So rest and digest, right. Going with what you're talking about. Um, Carolyn is that when our rest and digest is offline, it means we're in threat response likely. So that deer being followed by that lion, isn't going to sit down and have a dinner. It's not going to be able to have a nap. Same goes for us humans. So often in that, I've been working, I've been doing my life coping strategy until it doesn't work, is maybe there's digestive issues that happen. Maybe it's, oh gosh, now I'm an insomniac, right? Like all those things are not now suddenly, but I'm, I've disrupted yeah. sleep, all those things. Yeah. So this is an indication it can be like poor concentration for a digestive system. Like when I do my somatic counseling, when my clients burped, I get so excited. I get so excited. They're like, oh my goodness, so sorry. I burped. I was like, no, this means your digestive system's online and it's gurgling and gurgling. And this is what we want. This tells us that you're more settled. Um, tolerating. So another, how trauma can show up in our lives and signs of dysregulation. So how it can show up in our lives, tolerating abusive behaviors from others and innate feeling of shame. And again, shame is saying things like, so I made a mistake. So I forgot to pick up my child at school. Shame says, I'm a bad mother. I'm a bad human for doing that. Mm -hmm. Whereas guilt is like, oh, I did something that I wouldn't normally want to do. But it's outside of my value system. So shame is very much integral. I am a bad person. Yeah. And that is what trauma and abuse can happen as an impact for people. Our sense of self, our identity, our self confidence and self worth can be greatly impacted. Um, challenges with attaining goals of education, career, life goals, bucket lists. Um, health issues, digestive, immune, uh, headaches, insomnia, interrupted rest and digest, we already talked about. Uh, Hyperarousal can be like we get stuck on the fight flight, not the freeze. And actually, I have a little toy. It's called a Hoberman. This is our central nervous system, folks. This is freeze. It's super constricted, right? Can't digest. This is fight flight. And what we're looking for in our system somatically is a little bit of flow where we can not go to fight, flight, freeze. If we do go to fight, flight, freeze, we know what to do with ourselves. Take care of ourselves, not judge ourselves, not shame ourselves. Uh, but I love that visual. I know, Just, you know. I use this with my kids too at the school I work at. So hyperarousal is like anxiety, stress, panic attacks, racing heart. Our system physiologically can only handle so much. This is what happens when someone's in fight, flight mm -hmm. for... 20, 30 years as a, as you know, and so what we're looking for is a little bit of a breather. It's, it's similar to having like a gas and a brake pedal on at the same time in a car and expecting a car to have a, lot, a long, healthy life. Mm. So you think about it going up a hill, it's probably not going to work very well. You've got to pull over and rest and choose a brake or a gas, not both. Um, chronic pain, muscle tension, illnesses can be heart disease fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, many, many more, overwhelming feelings of confusion, sadness, rage, hopelessness, agitation, numbness. Um, the fight response looks like this. It could be anger. It could be literally fighting. It could be outbursts. It could be rage. It could be internalized, internalized rage too, not just at other people. It could be internal. A flight response might be workaholic, Overthinker, anxiety, panic, perfectionist, unable to follow through. <laughs> uh, freeze response can feel, have a felt sense of being stuck, um, difficulty making decisions, foggy brain being offline, or having gaps of time gone. So driving home and being like, oh, I don't remember how I drove home, but I'm here and I'm in my driveway and here I am, or I'm on the bus. I don't remember the bus route, but I, I got off at my stop and I'm here. So these are, so that's how our brain can kind of operate in the fight, flight, freeze. Um, and the biggest thing around that is the antidote to shame is like, when I'm in threat mode, I'm not going to have my brain online. I'm not going to shame myself for not being able to think clearly. I'm not going to shame myself for, you know, gapping out on how I got home. I'm literally in a threat response 
what can I do to take care of myself? So uh, this is how, this is the next point, how we can support emotional regulation and heal. Are you ready? Well, I was just going to say, you that say I, something. I had a feeling. Go ahead. Well, um, and I know there's a song for that. I've got a feeling. Um, <laughs> something Kirsten and I have done for years is if a random statement comes up, there's definitely a song for it. And then Kirsten will light up into song and has this incredible voice. Um, but <laughs> something expectations. <laughs> oh, I know. Um, don't get us started. Something that it, this is reminding me of is like that, so for example, workaholism, I don't want this to be about me, but I'll use the example. And I've done a lot of work around that. I've had a lot of support around that. So I have way healthier boundaries and I know when I'm tipping that scale. So I know, I, I know what I need to do there. But one of the things that I, I have been asked to do um, through some of my own healing work is to soothe the kidneys. So mm -hmm. it's some people believe like, gosh, Eva, you have a lot of baths. Well, I'm having baths because, um, you know, a counselor has basically guided me to do some somatic healing work to just rebalance my ecosystem. And so I will lie in a hot bath and make sure that my kidneys get some juice. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly what it's doing, but I do it and it has been really help yeah. helpful for my, my regulation yeah. or, you know, another resource may have been that, um, uh, through Chinese medicine support, getting acupuncture, just re release some of, just to get my ecosystem talking again, because there's clogs. Yeah. And I, you know, some of those may have been because of uh, blocked channels, because of habits, because of old stories. So opening some of those up. And what I can say is being on the other side of tuning into some of that somatic support. I'm just, I mean, that, would you say Kirsten, the Chinese medicine acupuncture is a form of supporting somatic? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, some of those practices, I have to say, have just been, A, I've had access. So there's privilege in that. And I do acknowledge that. Okay. B, thank goodness, because it, it brought so much grounding, presence, uh, access to be more present with what's going on versus in autopilot. Yeah. So yes. I just wanted to share yeah. the personal example, and it really resonates, and it seems it doesn't seem to make sense because we don't talk about it. Yeah. We don't normalize it. So it's that's part so of what we're talking about it now. Well, isn't it? But I would imagine there's got to be some stats around there. I would imagine all of us human beings has had some semblance of trauma at some point during their life. And, and usually everyone has. Not everyone's had chronic um, and um, complex trauma. Sure. But in terms of... Yeah, something that overwhelms our system and we don't get what we need to heal from it and something out of our choice. There's there's a lot of people walking around the world that have untended trauma, right? Yeah. So I know Absolutely. we started to talk about some of the things like what do we do? And you were talking about the isolation component. You were talking about the prefrontal uh, cortex and the nervous system, which I love and self-regulating that. Other ideas around what one should do if they they're interested based on our conversation? Mm -hmm. in terms of interest in how to support emotional regulation just yeah or or okay. anything at all just around trauma yeah. what kind what I mean some of the tips that you already provided I think are are you know I never even thought about that the mm -hmm. the non-isolation and that type of thing yeah. but Coming other things station. to do yeah I, there's lots to do and I want sorry go ahead. oh no hey well welcome to uh you know Eva's welcome to Pithy Musings uh welcome to Pithy Musings but I and, and I'm really interested to know like there's that which we can do to support ourselves as individuals and that which we can do to support another person in appropriate yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yes, I don't have a list on there, but I will of that second piece, but I do of the first. Um, and this is all written down. Anyone can get this from, from Eva and Carolyn too, who are, who are subscribing. So how we support emotional regulation once we notice. So we notice we're dysregulated, we gapped out, we're angry, we're fleeing a situation. Often I can tell if my flight is can, starting with me, if I'm in a situation and my feet start tapping on the floor, if I'm like, I don't want this conversation to happen, right? So just honoring that our fight flight freezes, our physiology, that there's nothing wrong with us. Tending to ourselves is in our control and is in our, our power place often. Um, so one of the key things we need, I'm going to repeat it again, because I think it's super important and probably will connect to what your second question or your second point 
Eva, is what can we do to support others? One of the key things we need to heal from trauma is to have an empathetic witness. I'll say it again. For example, in community therapists, friends, family groups that see us, hear us, believe us of everything that happened to us and they don't minimize. And they don't say, why is it still happening? Oh my goodness, all those things. So that's how we can support others that just because we may see ourselves, oh, I went through that car accident, but Kirsten still can't get in her car. I'd be able to get back in my car by now. What's wrong with her? Like presenting it that way is pretty, pretty unhelpful, but a helpful way would be, how are you doing with that? Is there anything you need? And then also trying not to give unsolicited advice and also not trying to fix. Um, just like any of us humans, if we're really struggling with something, often we, unless we say, please help me, I want you to fix me, which a lot of people do, uh, or some people do, or I need a resource, or I need your, like, what did you do? Like, just asking people what they need, um, because sometimes if we start giving insolicit advice or kind of trying to problem solve or fix things, beautiful intention, but it can also be re-traumatizing because there's no empathetic witness in there. There's, I know better, I'm going to fix it. Or I did this, it's going to fix for me. Two, no two people are the same. What works for one person may not work for another. So really honoring their autonomy, honoring their experience, honoring their voice. If they don't want to share with you, it's not personal. That's actually part of healing is setting boundaries and taking care of ourselves and supporting whatever they need, right? Um, I don't know about you, Eva, but I've, I've just got the tingles because you talk about empathetic witness and I don't know if I've ever really heard that term before but I get it on such a visceral level, right? I, I'm thinking in my own life that the times where I felt nurtured in that trauma, whatever that might look like, and being seen yeah. is when I felt probably the best is the wrong word, but in the times where I've had relationships where they, they did those myths that you were talking about, Eva, right? Like, well, I just get over it. And I've had those people, right? It, um, I can see how that empathetic witness is a key component yeah. to going through life in a, in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. And my hope for our viewers and watchers is that they have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes a lot of people don't have that. They have to shift communities and set boundaries with family yes. and friends. And they, it's a very lonely road. There's a very big lonely period of healing for some people, that they have to forge new relationships, new friendships, new community, new connections. And that's, in the context of pandemic, that's very challenging. But even before Mm -hmm. pandemic can be really challenging. And that's why sometimes people have a hard time setting boundaries with their community that they grew up in, because it's also connection, even if it's Mm -hmm. unhealthy connection. So it's a Mm -hmm. real giving yourself a lot of patience, but knowing that you have a right to be around people who support you, see you, um, understand you, you know, and want to want you to articulate what you need um and that's that real just holding space for someone is is not fixing it's just being there um so how we can uh, continuation how we can support a more emotional regulation exercise or movement of any kind uh fun fact it just it takes 22 minutes of walking to lower cortisol levels that's from my acupuncturist um a good cry and again, this relationship with crying, depending on how it was you, in growing up, if you had shame attached and punishment to crying, then a good cry is not going to be easy. So honoring yourself with that journey. Um, but uh, crying releases oxytocin and endorphins. Those are the happy chemicals that ease emotional and physical pain. Mm-hmm. So once people kind of work on their relationship with crime, if it's been very challenging, sometimes that release can be quite, quite nurturing. Uh, creativity, creative expression, so dance, art, write, doodle, big hugs, emotional connections with safe, regulated people. And I'm going to put safe, regulated people. I put it in bold. I put it in bigger font and I had an underline under it <laughs> because uh, if we're with someone who's unsafe and they're not regulated, that's not going to help with any type of regulation for our system. That's why kids need us to be regulated so they can come into co-regulation. At certain ages of kids, they can't regulate themselves and need humans around them, adults around them to do that regulation with them. Um, enough sleep, uh, lots of water, nutritious food, being <laughs> in nature. Find I'm in trouble rest. all over the place here. No, these are, just, these are just ideas. You don't have to do all of them. These are just an idea you can pick. Yep. You get choice. Find some grounding practices that work for you and then wait for it. Practice. And grounding practices won't always work the first time. There's so many different ones out there. You find the one that works for you. And if it stops working one day, it doesn't mean you're broken. It means 
you're ready to move on to a different practice. Uh, a heat pad, hot water bottle, or bath on your lower back kidney areas, like Eva was saying. Yes. That, yeah, that supports, that supports, <laughs> that supports uh, our adrenals. <laughs> so that supports our adrenals. So our kidneys can get hammered with uh, high cortisol levels and lots of stress and the stress response. So if you feel like you've been like this or like oh. this for years or days or minutes, tending to your, your kidneys in the morning at night, like sandwiching your day can be really nice not just when you're feeling really stretched but as like a supportive measure I actually right now have a hot water bottle on my back on my lower kidneys every time I sit in this chair and do any you know it's super interesting and personal example I mean some of our viewers and watchers know that I have a special needs kiddo and I would say so um about I'm gonna say three or four years ago we found that the bath like and he would stay in there for hours we limit it to one hour as soon as he gets his day going he goes into the bath and part of his complexity is around you know tightness of muscle um seizure disorders that kind of thing so now i'm getting some hey it's not just a nice bath he's likely getting some kind of kidney support whatever yeah absolutely unbelievable great and the seizures would would probably be so traumatic to his system that's right. The number of them that he's having per day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bless his soul. Bless his soul. Maybe he needs one at night too. Sorry, go on, Kirsten. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So laughter, laughter yeah. at, I, in my list oh. here says it's in all caps and in bold because it's one of the quickest ways for us to come out of a stress response that fight, flight, freeze. Yeah. I had a lovely colleague. I still have a lovely colleague. She's, she's not fast. She talked about a laughter being like an internal massage. Yeah, Hopefully. and that also can happen in like, and you don't have to be in person necessarily, but sometimes part of the strategies that I have, I ask my clients for self care strategies over a weekend if they have a hard weekend coming. What makes you laugh? Oh, silly kitten videos. Put it on repeat. Oh, goofy, <laughs> goofy dog down the slide. America, America's Home videos, whatever. Or funny <laughs> home videos. Do it on repeat. Doesn't have to make sense if it's a if a movie that you know you're going to get a guaranteed laugh that you've been watching for 20 years. Watch that, and that's not um, and that's just to engage it because the laughter is so 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 important. Um, I worked at a at a uh, a nonprofit that literally exclusively works with trauma, and all I did all day is laugh. I laughed so much with clients, with my colleagues, because it's an actual necessity. Kind of, it's part of a resource to kind of have us keep on holding what we need to hold. Um, singing with others or on our own, there's a central nervous system, excuse me, there's a central nervous system nerve called the vagus nerve, and it's the biggest one. It actually runs through our body and right through our eardrums. So when we hum, it actually allows us to connect this vagus nerve really quickly. Uh, that nerve, when we're connected to it, tells us we're safe. That gives us the message to the body that we're safe. So if you're really having a scary day coming or a really hard conversation, you're driving or you're on the bus or you're walking, if you can even just hum as low as, and also the tone is um, sing really, really low. Don't sing super, super high because you probably get a little bit more stressed out, but it actually helps settle our, our thing. So at the end of every day, I drive home, I have about a 20 minute drive. I low tone hum to every song on the radio. I take the lowest register as long as it's not hurting my voice. Mm-hmm. And I hum and I hum and I hum and I hum. And then I sometimes say words, I sometimes don't, but you don't actually have to sing. But a lot, I mean, that's what choirs and music and musicians and arts, like that's such a, an amazing outlet in that way. Mindful breathing, you don't have to be a yogi to do this. This is also one way to connect to the, yo- the, the yoga nerve. I wish there was a yoga nerve, that would be funny. The vagus nerve that I just talked about with the humming, you can most easily connect to it as well by slowing your out breath. So the, um, not like panting, but really taking a nice normal deep breath in and then slowly, slowly exhaling. That connects us to the vagus nerve too. Uh, less stimulus, so less person, place, and things. Uh, less doom scrolling, if that is something that, that we get doing. Um, last but never least, setting boundaries of unhelpful patterns, mm-hmm. activities, peoples, places, things that don't support your wellness or your healing. Um, and there's a little quote that I always say, setting boundaries means I can love you and me simultaneously, right? So you're setting boundaries not just with unhealthy maybe people, but maybe people you adore. Like Eva, I adore you, but if you ask me to go for a walk when I'm absolutely maxed and even getting into my car feels like too much, I may have to say no, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, which I think I have in the past. Um, and how we notice we're regulated, right? This is another list. So slow and steady heart rate, calmer emotions, like never, like you don't have to be Zen, but kind of more online, mm -hmm. right? Your brains come instead of flipping off. So the lion's gone away, the deer's come back to the water and hole. It might've been a, about a day for those like stress chemicals to kind of settle. Now the deer is breathing with a bit more calm, calm belly, even breathing, clearer thinking. We can make connections a bit better. We don't lose our words. Um, eye contact can be easier when we're regulated. Connecting to our body and our body sensations. Um, and breathing is expansive. What I mean by expansive is if we are in this, in this state, freeze or fight flight, or we're really like, we are not breathing in a really, really regulated way. So if we're noticing, oh, I actually have more breath, like my posture is different. Like I know when I'm going into a bit of a fight flight when I get dizzy, because I actually don't take a deep breath. And I'm like, okay, slow down, sit down, Kirsten, sit down. So that's kind of, that's the kind of list. And I will, it's not a perfect exhaustive list by any means, but it's something that your, your subscribers can take a look at with all of my, my spelling mistakes and everything, you know. Oh, it, it's, it's a really generous share and, and, and a, an informative share. You know, I, I feel like I've, I've tried to understand trauma and I've had you as a beloved friend and had other influences in life that helped me understand it and kind of break it down. And it's been so helpful. Um, some of what you've just shared is like lights are going off. I'm like, oh, I need, I, I need to check myself on this, this, and this. Um, and, and, you know, before we, we close it out, if we see someone in, a, if we have someone in our lives, mm -hmm. could be someone at work, could be uh, someone just in our communities who maybe we see patterns and we really see that they would benefit from getting healing support is there an appropriate way to offer that in your view? Um, rescuing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's so many different contexts and tones, right? The way that I'm thinking of it is I've had people only, if people want to know information, they will reach out, they will ask, they will come to it. And, I'm, and so someone says, hey, do you know of anything that works with like trauma and the body responses? You'd be like, yeah, actually I know a thing called blah, blah, blah. you know, you, somatic experiencing, you talk about it. But often I would say that uh, there's many behavioral patterns of trauma responses and rescuing and kind of fixing is one of them. So sometimes checking out like, am I trying to like, it's one of my coping strategies kind of going over someone else's, you know, kind of autonomy. But if someone says, I literally have no resources, I don't know where to turn. Do you have any ideas? That would be my, that would be something of a flavor of an intro of like, hey, there's information needed. Usually what I would encourage people to do is trust that the other human in front of you is doing okay and has the capacity and the wherewithal to deal with what they need to deal with and that they have the resilience and they have the smarts. But if you see someone literally falling apart in front of you, you can just even just gently say, hey, I'm, I hope you're doing okay. I noticed that that there's some different things happening. Are you all right? Like that really gentle, compassionate curiosity. Yeah, because we can have, a, someone can feel very uh, minimized or kind of, you know, someone in power was saying, oh, I know exactly what it is for you, right? Like, I've, I've, I've had clients who said, I've been talked about, I've been told I should go into counseling for years, and I was never ready until I was ready. And that's really, really what it, it comes down to. Yeah. Um, but sharing resources is amazing. People being curious is amazing, mm -hmm. right? Um, but yeah, I would say it can be pretty challenging, I, it, just making sure it's not unsolicited, unless someone says, help, you're in a field or you do this, or, you know, some people you've been in Victoria a long time, or you've been in Calgary a long time. Like who are the people that you would trust? Because I, that's how I find all that. That's how I find my health team. Like I go to like the acupuncturist that's been highly recommended, the massage therapist or different modalities of counseling that other people have found. Um, but yeah, like, and I think that's what caretaking can be a real trauma response where we kind of do we take care of those people needs or we assume they don't know so really trusting in their autonomy their own personal power their own wherewithal of like if they need help they'll ask mm -hmm. and also know that not everyone will ask and feel comfortable asking so the, the great thing we can do is just be really uh, gentle and open and not say what works for us 
but to say, hey, I noticed you're struggling. I hope you're okay. I'm a, I'm a listening ear if you ever want me to be there, depending on the relationship. If it's a professional relationship, it may be different. If it's personal, you know, you get to have your boundaries too. But I mean, the example of some, like if you're at a business meetings and, you know, five times in a row, that person is an hour late, that's impacting you. Mm-hmm. You can talk with them about that and say, hey, is there a different time? Is there a better time? I'm not, cause that's not working for me. Right. So again, back to boundary setting and just being curious, but and the thing is we get so excited when we have something that works for us and we want to offer it to the world. And yet it's not, it may not be for that other person. I think that's that, a really important yeah. point. Yeah. That's a really important point. Carolyn, is there, I feel like there's 85 episodes here <clears> and, <throat> um, is there anything on your mind that, that you want to say before we very lovingly uh, close out this really, really important conversation. Very lovingly, man, did I, I learn a ton. Thank you for your time. I, I put this on a sticky note, which says rest and it. digest. Oh. And then on another one, I've got empathetic witness. So I think it's about creating the energy to be the empathetic witness for others and to create the energy that someone could be the empathetic witness toward me. So um, I thank you, Eva, for you. Yeah, it, it really validating um, and validating to a lot of thought processes and also built on uh, resources, whether it's for self or, or in support of another and really helpful to hear our, our desire to help another person with something that maybe worked for us. That's not necessarily our, our place. Yeah. Um, so just, I, I love that you've put together this amazing, generous resource that we can share with folks. We'll make it available for people. Um, and just, just really appreciate your, wow. Just, I know you are so kick-ass in your field and the clients and people who have the privilege of working with you are so blessed. As a friend, I feel so blessed. Um, so we have a question for you before we close it out. Do you want me to do that really one a one minute somatic release for you guys before we before you ask me the question or do we not have time? Carolyn? Let's do it. Let's do it. So my thank so I want to say thank you for having me both of you. This like how much time, energy, support, love, smarts, amazing, courageous women that you are. So like, yeah, it feels really good to be here. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, on the attachment that you can send out to your subscribers, there's two things I was going to do, but we're going to just do one because of our time. It's one, one is one minute somatic release. And the other one is a five, four, three, two grounding. So, okay. right. But we're going to do the one minute somatic release. So literally, it's just paying attention to what our body's doing. Uh, so here we go. Unclench your jaw <laughs> in any way you want. Sometimes you can hold it in. <laughs> Unclench your jaw. Drop your shoulders. I'll do it with you because I need your to as well. Hands. Shake your hands out. Now, if you have anyone out there is watching this and there's a recent head injury, please do not do this one. Okay. And if your eyes are okay doing this, move your eyes gently side to side and not efforting to the point where you're hurting your eyes, but just look side to side where it feels like you want to go. And as you're doing this eye moving back and forth, just noticing your breath without needing to change it. This is a fun one. Stick your tongue out and exhale. <sighs> And take three deep belly breaths, focusing on the slowing, just the slowing of the out breath. So we'll do that. At your own pace. And sometimes when we're guiding belly breaths, holding onto your belly if it feels doable, but you get choice. There we go. That's the one minute somatic release. I love it. I do it every time I'm about to go into a, into a session or a hard conversation. Ooh, totally yeah. stealing that. Ooh, I and, uh, and after. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and after. And you, and you have my question. I have a question or the person before is asking me a question. Well, so the person who, and thank you for that, 
because I think we, many of us talk about, especially in um, some of the work that Carolyn and I do separate and together, you know, we talk about mindfulness and we have colleagues who specialize in that, in that space too. This expands on that toolkit and deepens the meaning and the potential of why it's important to spend that time. So thank you. Um, okay, the question is, what question do you have for our next guest? Right. It's a new feature, so you're the first one. Uh -huh, uh -huh, and we don't, uh -huh. we're, we're an, and we aren't sharing who our next guest will be. Just imagine something you're curious about. Wide open, something I'm curious about. Could be anything. Could be absolutely anything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. it's just there's just so many things um can you roll your tongue oh, nice. <laughs> that's it because some people can't Love evidently I yeah can't. there's something about that yeah yeah I met someone who couldn't and I thought that person was joking but they weren't that's just it's very fascinating to me I what think I love that question. I can't, I don't know. <laughs> it would be fascinating to see the response. Um, yeah. But I think the idea behind the question for the next guest is really to show the connectedness of all of us. Um, and you can ask anybody any question, whether it be someone in, in your field or someone who's a CEO or whatever, we're all connected in some way, shape or form. Yeah. So for our viewers and watchers, um, if you want to keep putting the funk back into humanity, you know what you need to do. And that is to subscribe to our channel, which is currently on YouTube, soon to be where all other um, vlogs, podcasts, whatever we're calling them, can be found, Spotify, etc. cetera. Um, we do have a music playlist on Spotify. We're already there with a bunch of disco, put the funk back into humanity. Uh, feedback, we really, really, really listen to your feedback. And one of the reasons why we're doing guests this year is because you've asked that. If you want to find Eva, she can be found at livewithfervor.com. And I can be found at uh, talktalk.ca. So with that, again, Kirsten, thank you so much. Cheers to you. Thank you. We did some good work here. Till so next time, Eva, stay pithy. And... Keep music. Keep music. <laughs> Until next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.